This is the edge of Europe, as far west as you can go. Beyond us is 3,000 miles of the grey Atlantic. For the early Christian monks who settled here almost 1,500 years ago, Skellig Michael off the southwest coast of Ireland was the farthest shore, and they aspired to its isolation. This is a story about searching for God on the margins. They went because the whole island, its straining peaks, seemed a constant reaching in stone towards God. They coursed its image through fog and swell, in skin boats finding, ultimately, a landing. Here was in truth a hard station, gathering limpets to sustain nights praying towards illumination. The path that leads to Skellig also leads back to monastic settlements, such as this one at Kilreelig, high on the slopes of Bolus in Ivroch. In such places, the monks were as isolated as they could be on the mainland. Here they were indeed in extremis, physically and spiritually. But why this yearning for extremities? Why this powerful urge towards isolation? At Kiel Reelig, high on the bare headland, the wind is skinning the side of the mountain. You can almost see it peeling the thin soil, heather and furs, down to the bare rock as the monks once peeled the world from their lives and shed their selves in search of another. Kilreelig was different from the great central, almost urbanised monasteries of Clonmacnoise, Artfert or Glendalough. It was part of a movement that flourished in Ireland in the centuries following the coming of St. Patrick and Christianity. The monks who sought out these Atlantic retreats were driven by a spirituality that was centrifugal rather than centripetal. They retreated from the centres to search for God on the margins. This idea of searching for God in the margins had its origins far from this coastline and in a landscape very different from these windswept heights. The spiritual ancestors of the monks of Kilreelig were the Eremites, literally desert dwellers, who lived and prayed in the burning sands of Egypt and found God through a rigorous asceticism, punishing their flesh through prayer and fasting. When this movement spread up through Europe, its Irish adherents had to find an equivalent for the deserts of its founding fathers. This search for isolation brought the Irish hermits to margins such as Kilreelig. This was their desert. This Egyptian influence spread to Ireland during the 6th century. It is seen in this simple gable shrine at Kilaluig, overlooking Valencia Island, where the bones of some now forgotten saint were venerated by pilgrims. Such gable shrines are common in the southwest. But it is not the shrine which is our main concern here, but the eremitical drive that this Egyptian influence introduced into Ireland. The Irish monks had no deserts in which to mortify themselves. Instead, they moved out towards the edges. In places such as this, abandoning the world and yet in close communion with nature, 
the monks continued their search. This circular stone wall, or cashel, enclosed their holy ground. In places, it seems almost defensive and may originally have been a fortification. Whether or not this is so, what it protected the monks against was a spiritual rather than a tribal enemy. These simple stone crosses betoken a spirituality which valued only the essential and still remind us here of that essential. In succeeding centuries, such simplicity would give way to the ornate extravagance of the great high crosses of the large monastic centres. But here, look at the remains of the tiny oratory, perhaps the smallest in the country. It is minimalist in any architectural sense. You can see it would hardly have had space for anybody other than the celebrant of its masses. Built up close against the Cushel wall, there isn't even the eastern altar window which is so characteristic of this type of oratory. But the spiritual aspirations which it enclosed must have expanded hugely beyond its confines and included the huge panorama of God's creation which would have greeted the monk who emerged from its darkness. Well, you have two forms of monasticism. Uh, one is the communal type, which is the type that we're more acquainted with today, uh, where the monks live together, uh, share all their daily tasks, and interact with the wider community around them. Then you have the eremitical style, uh, where hermits uh, live very solitary lives, and they deliberately seek out isolated locations where they would have minimal contact with both monks like themselves and indeed with the wider world. Of course, the men who searched for God here also had to deal with the practicalities of life. I often used to wonder how they survived in such places. Perhaps they supplied all their own food. Perhaps they were helped in this by a lay community which they may have served. Excavations in similar sites have shown that the inhabitants ate well, if plainly. From Church Island in nearby Valencia Harbour, we know that the monks ate meat, seabirds, fish, shellfish, vegetables, bread, porridge and perhaps milk. Apart from such fragmentary information, the lives of these eremitical monks lie in mysterious anonymity. Here, for example, the tiny dimensions of the oratory, the smallest in Ireland, coupled with the fact that the Ljacht, or burial ground, lies outside the Cashel Wall, has given rise to the theory that the monastery was established on the site of an older fortification, which was perhaps donated to the monks by some local chieftain. But without historical information, theory it must remain. Again, this covered passage leading into the principal cell, presumably the abbots, is unique in Ireland. Was it an escape route of some sort? Or did it have a ritual significance, connecting the holy ground inside the monastery with the secular world outside? Or was it simply underground storage space to keep perishable food fresh? These ancient stones offer many questions, but very few answers. Some answers, although not a lot, are to be found in Church Island on Loch Curran, near Waterville.
here, set in a lake by the seashore, which, according to the Liaur Gawala, was where the first Celtic invaders came to Ireland, the Celtic Christian monks pushed out the frontiers of their spirituality, this time to an island on what Amergin, the first Celtic poet, had described as a fish-teeming lake. A natural abundance of fish and game and a fairly productive soil would have made survival here relatively easy. I imagine that it was its beauty, its isolation, its opportunities for private prayer and fasting, while at the same time being close to God in nature, that appealed to the monks. With some of the stone remains here, we are left with the same hermetic anonymity as we met with in Kilreelig. These small crosses retain their secrecy, and those who are resting underneath them have answered only to their God about the lives they led. But at monasteries like Church Island, formerly known as Inishuasal, anonymity begins to give place to history. Here, for example, we're told by the inscription on this cross that it marks the grave of a potential king of Kerry. The monastic movement and the civil order are beginning to coalesce. Church Island in Waterville Lake uh, is a very interesting site because the monuments on it span a very long period. Uh, we have some cross slabs, for instance, there, a very fine selection of them, uh, some of which probably date to the 8th century uh, and others date up to the 12th. Um, there's also an intriguing monument known as St. Finian's Cell, uh, the purpose of which we're not quite sure. Uh, but again, it may date from as early as the 6th century, although I'm inclined to think it probably is 10th or 12th century. Much later, this ornate medieval cross slab was used to decorate a 19th century tomb. But the process was to be a long, slow one something which allows Church Island to tease us, as it were, with the odd name or identity and still retain its air of mystery. The foundation of this settlement is a case in point. This whole area is associated with St. Finan in all sorts of ways, from the foundation of the Skellig Monastery to Holy Wells, Pattern Days, schools, churches and this island monastery. Obviously there must be some historical basis for this, but factual information is scarce. Which Finan are we talking about? Is it Fanon Kaum, Fanon the Squint-Eyed? Or is it Fanon Lauer, Fanon the Leper? Whatever the literal truth, the saintliness of the monks who came to this island to find God still inheres in the stone monuments they have left us. And some of them have left us their names. On this beautifully designed cross, we can decipher the inscription Benacht for Anman Alamchede, a blessing on the soul of Alamchede. Recent research by John Sheehan in the Annals of Innisfallen has discovered that Alamchede, who is referred to as the hermit or anchorite of God, was buried here in 1057. So we have a name and a date for this monument. We are now into history. One other detail makes Alamkud's cross very special to me. I said a beautifully designed cross, but the sculptor made one mistake. 
He didn't leave enough room for the name on the shaft of the cross, so Alamkud gets his own very special place here. Spirituality, art, history and human fallibility. Such a combination makes for poetry. In the annals of Inishvalen, he was God's anchorite. On the island, his inscription is simpler in stone. Benacht for Anamin Anamchutte, the slab implores, but the blessing on his soul, the sculptor misjudging space, edged Anamchutte off the shaft, to rest like a tender afterthought, tucked, almost embraced, between the arm and body of the cross. There was another right arm here a millennium ago, which still gives joy to those who seek it out and listen to its music in their imagination. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this little fellow here, known locally as the Fiddler, who would have been one of the many sculptures on an arch between the nave and the chancel. Just himself and this carved head survive, listening to each other for the last thousand years. The harmony of the small, ruined church remains like deconstructed musical instruments in paintings. Its east to west axis is a string played from the altar window to the Roman doorway. Between the roofless nave and chancel, the imagined mediation of an arch rests on its broken pillars, where carved, sitting snug, always one who refused to go, a stone fiddler is playing away by the new time. God knows his friends and relations probably spread themselves over the arch, making for an almighty session. Blank-faced, intent on music, he has for centuries repeated his noble call to make the stone sing. Of course, after prayer, work would have been preeminent on the island. Laborare orare est, the monks would have said. To work is to pray. All around us are the vestiges of buildings, enclosures, and small stone walls. And this structure behind me, in the confusion of theories about its purpose, embodies some of the strands that refuse to weave themselves into any definable pattern. According to tradition, this is St. Finan's cell. But its size and shape would indicate otherwise. Some archaeologists say it's relatively modern. Others, that it was for storing grain for the monastery. And the essentially spiritual nature of the work that cultivated this island is still palpable here. The remains of this beautiful Romanesque doorway on the 12th century church remind us that about this time, the Irish church became increasingly central and Romanized. But for centuries before that, as far back perhaps as the seventh century, the monks who sought out God in lonely places went to the ultimate edge of Europe, Skellig Vihil. Oh, 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 oh,
After visiting Skellig almost a century ago, George Bernard Shaw wrote to a friend that he had landed on the most impossible and most fantastic rock in the world. I tell you it belongs to no world that you and I have worked and lived in. It is part of our dream world. Well, we're about to see if the devout old atheist was right and to see if we can discover something of what drove devout Christians out here in skin boats almost 1,500 years ago. This must have been the ultimate heritage. You can see how bare it is. We're seven miles from the nearest part of the mainland, near Kilreelig, seven miles that are often treacherous. Even in summer, heavy swells can make landing dangerous here. So much so that the monks had three different landing places on opposite sides of the island, which would be used according to the direction of wind and weather. From each landing place, a set of steps led to the monastery. One set started here, cut painstakingly into the bare rock. In European terms, Skellig is very important. Uh, there are sites which share some similarities to it, uh, the most obvious being Mont Saint-Michel uh, in France. But it has many later buildings added onto it. Um, if one wants to see what a 6th or 7th century monastery looked like, uh, one has to travel to Skellig Michael to see it. Um, there are other sites on the continent which had great intellectual impact. Uh, Monte Cassino, for instance, uh, the Monastery of St. Gaul. But again, in order to come into touch with uh, the saints of the early medieval period uh, in any European context, and in order to do it in a, in a very strong and vivid way, one has to visit the Skelligs. It seems as if it wasn't enough for these men to live isolated and celibate lives of prayer and fasting in a bare, inhospitable place like Skellig. They also had to make it more difficult for themselves and, as it were, move closer to God by climbing up the high peaks of the island to establish their settlement. This strange silhouette is traditionally known as the Wailing Woman on Van Chinte and was part of a penitential route since at least medieval times. I've often wondered, is it just a natural standing rock shaped by wind and rain which reminded the pilgrims of the women weeping for the crucified Christ? Or is it the eroded remains of a cross shaped by the monks? We will never know but it is part of the very essence of Skelly.
With each of the 600 steps we climb, our journey becomes more and more awe-inspiring. This cross was certainly carved by the early hermits, perhaps by the monk who lived in this cell, who used the natural shape of the rock and enhanced it by his carving for the greater glory of God. This art has almost no social or decorative context. It was not produced for the public, even the religious public. It is really a prayer set in stone, made to last immeasurably longer than the lifetime of its maker. Indeed, the whole island, as we will see, can almost be described as a permanent prayer, still vibrant centuries after its composers have taken a more eternal path. This is where I always like to stop and pause for breath. This is Christ's saddle, a dip in the middle of the island which is relatively clear. Geologists think that this is because the monks quarried this area for the stone they used for steps and buildings. In fact, the steps from the northern landing arrive up here to join with those we have just climbed. They are overgrown here and can be seen only from the sea. Throughout medieval Europe, uh, from the 12th century onwards, there was a strong uh, association, a strong cult of St. Michael. And Michael the Archangel is associated with lofty places, so that in Normandy we have Mont Saint-Michel, uh, which in some ways is similar uh, to the Skelligs. It's a, a peak with a monastery on top. Also in Cornwall, uh, we have another site associated with St. With Michael, which again shares the physical characteristics of the Skelligs here. One of the things that is so striking about Skellig is its verticality. Was it this sense of continuous ascent that first drew the monks here? The feeling that the eye is constantly being drawn upwards? That the horizontal world of the everyday is being transfigured into a world focused on heaven? We'll make that ascent now, to see where the monks climb towards God led them. Questions become my certainties. Each day on the bare peak, scaling hand over hand, over foothold, to God. What is this sheer rock, plunging and rising to and from the abyss? Upon this rock I will build. What is the air's true voice? Gales lash my oratory, but seabirds land gently on warm wings. There are many voices. Where is the fire on the rock? In the soul's forging, hammered bright to outlast the flames that burn the untempered soul. What is the surrounding water? In the soft noted woods, we coveted chastening deserts. This is my salty waste. In the name of the Father, hidden in clouded skies, of the water flowing in the baptism of the sun and of the fire of the Holy Spirit, I will cling to this hard rock until I become no more and no less than a syllable in the breath of the word. This is where all the steps lead. This is the monastery of Skellig Vihil, with little Skellig a mile away in the background. George Bernard Shaw was impressed when he stood here. He wrote that whoever has not stood in the graveyard on the summit of that cliff among the beehive dwellings and their beehive oratory does not know Ireland through and through. Whatever about knowing Ireland through and through, 
To stand here is to stand in the very heart of the eremitical tradition in Ireland. Here, it seemed the searcher for God was as far from the ordinary world as it was possible to be. Those who lived in these beehive huts and prayed in these oratories had travelled far, spiritually and physically, and their sole purpose here was to prepare themselves for the ultimate journey. Their bones rest here in this liacht, and wherever their souls are, the spirit that brought them here is almost palpable in this enclosure. Regina Celi, Alleluia, qui aque meruristi portare, Alleluia, resurrexit sicur dixit, Alleluia, Ora pro nobis Deum, Alleluia. Of course, there were the practicalities. Food would have been fish, shellfish, seabirds, all of which were obviously plentiful, with grain and flour from the mainland. But water would have been a problem. There is no freshwater spring on the island. Without water, the monks could not have stayed here. Their solution shows a sophisticated level of advanced planning. These cisterns store water, rainwater, up to 500 litres of it, which ran off the large slabs behind these cells and was carried by stone channels underneath the cells and stored here. So water, which was of such symbolic importance in the Christian tradition, enable the monks to stay here and to contribute to that tradition. Our climb has brought us 600 feet above the churning waves. The monks who lived in this enclosure must have felt that this was the ultimate isolation. Incredibly, for at least one monk, it was not isolated enough. He left the enclosure, crossed Christ's saddle, climbed up a terrifying rock face and built a cell and an oratory on a narrow ledge up there on the dizzy heights of the South Peak. The South Peak is the part of the monastery uh, where originally in the early medieval period there was a small hermitage. It's a very dangerous climb. Uh, you have to go through uh, the eye of the needle. Uh, you have to go up through vertical uh, cliffs where there are handholds and toe holes, you have to eventually, when you get to the top, climb out a piece of rock known as the spit, where there was a cross originally located, and you had to kiss this cross and then go backwards along the spit again and climb down. Noon drew heat from stone, carried the eye up and down crevices where clumps of sea pink balanced between water and sky. Haze dissolved the horizon until only the island perspective remained, stonily insistent on the vertical. After such a denial of the world, it is almost with relief that we learn that, partly due to church reform and the increasing influence of Rome, the monks moved back to the mainland and to the monastic world of cloisters, refectories, gardens, dormitories, and above all, level ground. And it was to hear to balance Skellig's Abbey, according to the 13th century historian Geraldus Cambrensis, that the monks of Skellig moved during the 12th century. We're still on the margins here, right on the edge of the sea. In fact, quite a lot of the monastery buildings have disappeared into the Atlantic waves. But this time, we're on our way back from the extreme edges. 
The movement that brought the monks here was centripetal rather than the centrifugal movement that sent them across the sea to Schellig. They were moving back to the centre, geographically and spiritually. They were to become part of a church that was centralised, controlled by bishops who were in turn controlled by Rome. The individualistic, almost anarchic Celtic church was being tamed and organised. Physically, the monastery in Ballinskelligs is quite different uh, from the Skelligs. The buildings there are built according to a rigid architectural code. You have the church uh, on the north side, a cloister on the south side, with various buildings uh, built around the cloister, all of which had a particular uh, function. The monks would now live in a monastery whose basic plan was similar to monasteries all over Europe and whose rule was standard for its order all over Europe. The monks were now Augustinians, an order invited to Ireland by Malachy, Bishop of Armagh, as part of a reform that would control the wild spirit that sent holy men to the peaks of Schellig. This reformist movement, together with the related Norman invasions of the 12th century, was to bring profound change to the Irish church. Here, where once stood the chapter house, the monks would gather each day at a regular hour to listen to a chapter of the Augustinian rule that governed their lives. Later, they would walk around this square, which would have had a cloistered path all around, saying their office and other ordained prayers at the ordained times. This was the refectory, where all meals were eaten in common, while the monks listened to the lector, the one chosen to read the scriptural passage of that day. The monks now had a social function. The bell which tolled out from this tower called the people of the surrounding area to prayer. And long after the monks have gone, the monastery is still holy ground for the people of Balan Skelligs. If one goes to the Skelligs, or indeed any other monastic site in this area, pre-12th century, you'll find that there's no such rigid code. Uh, there's a lot of fluidity uh, in terms of where individual buildings were located. In, in, in a sense, there was more freedom within the Celtic tradition uh, when it comes to architectural layout and design. But in Ban Skelligs, at the 12th century medieval monastery, there is this uh, rigidity, uh, which in a way is indicative of the rigidity of the order uh, and of the continental monastic rule, which was introduced to Ireland at this time. It's very different from the Celtic form of monasticism that we see represented at Skellig Michael. I'm not suggesting that the monks here had an easy life. They fasted regularly and prayed constantly. This church would have echoed to their prayers at all hours of the day and night and in all weathers and seasons. What's different from the lives of the Schellig monks is not the depth of their spiritual commitment, but the way in which that commitment was manifested and regulated. And here in Balan Schellig's Abbey, regulated is the key word. The monks' lives were as regular as the coming and going of the tides that lapped against their monastery wall. And of course, even apart from its name, Balan Skellig's Abbey was to remain connected with Skellig until it was confiscated during the Elizabethan conquest. In the year 1300, a papal document referred to the monastery's ownership of the Rock of St. Michael which was by now becoming a notable pilgrimage site, as well as being used by the Balanskelligs monks in the summer. It's almost as if the Augustinian monks, here on the seashore, were constantly reaching back to an older, more elemental spirituality that saw them wrestle with the elements, the devil and themselves.
It was a long and arduous path that had led the monks to Skellig, and an even longer and more arduous one they had followed on the island. For most of us today, such hardship and self-denial is difficult to understand, let alone to sympathise with. Perhaps all we can do, together with the thousands of people, believers and unbelievers alike, who visit Skellig each year, is to admire and to wonder. <laughs>